or had they run across another unexpected problem? <laughs> I mean, it could have just been the world's tallest wavy bridge if, if they didn't fix that, right? Hey, you. Yeah, you. Thanks for clicking on the video. We're going to check out a really tall bridge. <laughs> legitimately we have a video by the channel mega projects great great channel by the way the dude's named simon he's he's got like a ton of channels but this one's the milau milau i don't know how to pronounce it to be honest with you uh milau viaduct the world's tallest bridge so it says right here on uh copilot ai the Mila Viaduct spans across the valley of the River Tarn near Milao in southern France. Its highest tower soars to an impressive 1,125 feet, making it the tallest cable-stayed road bridge globally. Interestingly, the Milao Viaduct's tallest towers surpass the Eiffel Tower in height and are almost as tall as the Empire State Building. Very cool. So, very big, uh, very enormous bridge i like to check out infrastructure from other world or other countries and stuff like that so that's what we're doing today click like on the video there's going to be a link down in the description section for that and i do highly recommend uh this channel and again he, he does a ton of different channels this one's mega projects he's got one i really like called brain blaze which is is fantastic but uh yeah we're gonna check this out In the early 1960s, a cynical British commentator remarked that a motorway could be defined as the shortest distance between two traffic jams, and that cynical dude was absolutely correct. In the 1980s, France had a slightly different problem. Two motorways from opposite directions leading to the same traffic jam, Mio. Situated at the bottom Hello. of one of the deepest valleys in Europe, the medieval town, the center of the ceramics trade in Roman times and with its roots back in the Bronze Age, must have always been a difficult place to get to, through, or round. The okay. 20th century was on the most popular holiday route in the country, Paris to the Mediterranean, and regularly it suffered five or six hour traffic jams throughout July and August. Okay, so I don't see Malau. Or Milo, sorry. Oh, okay, right here where the red dot is. Le Viaduc de la Milo. Milo. Okay, cool. The high speed routes to the north and south stopped short of the chasm that was the Tan Valley. How to bridge the gap occupied the minds of planners, engineers, and architects for the best part of two decades. So, did they literally just build a bridge across this entire valley then? I guess that's what they did, right? So, does that bypass the whole town, though? That town's going to die because of it, right? No one's going to go through it. Which way? Four go. possible routes were considered. The road yeah. could bypass Mio to the east, crossing the Tarn and the Duby rivers on to very high bridges with spans of 800 and 1,000 meters respectively. These posed technical problems, but the main objection to this route was that Mio would basically be virtually cut off from the outside world. A bypass to the west was technically easier, but more expensive and 12 kilometers longer. The main drawback to this solution was the adverse impact on the environment, a factor that was particularly important considering the spectacular beauty of this area. Okay. A third suggested route was rejected because of its possible impact on future plans for the area, leaving the fourth possibility also to the west of Mew, crossing not only the river but the entire valley of the Tarn as the preferred route. This could be accomplished in one of two ways, a descent into the valley followed by a bridge, a viaduct, and a tunnel, or the seemingly impossible, a 2.5 kilometer long viaduct more than 200 meters above the river. And that's what they went with, which, wow. I mean, of course, you'd have to be there, you know, to see the actual scope of it, but it's taller than the Eiffel Tower and almost as tall as the Empire State Building, right? So, okay, so you can see a little, little tiny house or building, sorry, right here in a roundabout. Okay, so there's houses over there. I'm just trying to put it into perspective size-wise because it's really hard to tell, but... 
Man, it's massive. That is crazy. They chose the impossible. Yeah, they did. Ambitious plans. Fresh from the success of his Pond Normandy, at the time the longest cable stayed bridge in the world, Dr. Michel Virago had ambitious plans for Milo. While the Normandy Bridge had cable stays on both sides of the road deck, his concept for this viaduct had just one central set of stays and would be carried by not two, but nine piers right yeah. across the valley from the plateau on one side to the plateau on the other. You know, it's crazy. The cable stayed bridges, you know, it's so so the bridge is actually hanging from the top of this pole you know up whoops sorry up there at the at the top of that pole right and then you got the ropes the 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 cables that come down and hold it but it's technically hanging from the top i think right if i'm wrong i mean if there's any structural engineers or any bridge makers or anybody that's just you know in the bridges uh, bridge bridgeologist if you will uh Definitely let me know down there if I'm wrong in that, but that's what I think. Right across the valley from the plateau on one side to the plateau on the other. Unwilling to take a chance on one man's ideas, the French Roads Administration announced a competition for architects and engineers to come up with a practical design. By July okay. 1993, the applications by 17 engineers and 38 architects had been whittled down to eight structural engineers and seven architects to study the problem. Between okay. them and an independent panel of experts, they came up with five general design ideas by February 1995. The competition was relaunched with five engineering slash architectural partnerships doing in-depth studies of the selected approaches to the problem and in July of 1996 the multiple span cable stayed viaduct proposed by the structural engineering group Sogolog Europe Etudes Getzi and Surf with British architect Lord Norman Foster was selected nice. I'm gonna go back real quick though I want to look at these other options here we go we have what looks like a bunch of towers and then i don't know i i'm not again i'm not a bridgeologist so i don't really know the terminology of the different styles of bridges okay and then the one down here has a big arch so i don't know what the i mean clearly the second one here just doesn't look super structurally sound right the one on the Bottom looks better. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they definitely chose, obviously, one that works pretty well, so. Cable stayed viaduct proposed by British architect Lord Norman Foster was selected. Foster had taken Villago's concept even further into the realms of the impossible by cutting the number of piers to seven and making them even slimmer. The basis of his okay. thinking was to take an inventive piece of engineering and turn it into a work of art, something that would appear to rest lightly on the incredible mountain landscape. Yeah, and it really doesn't take up much. Like, when you think about it, it almost, almost just kind of blends in a little bit. Like, of course, you can tell it's there, but it's not ugly. It is, it is like a work of art. Like, it... Yeah, it doesn't deter from the landscape so much, right? What do we got here? The devil in the detail. The next two and a half years saw extensive studies being made so the intricate details of the design could be finalized. A geological survey showed that the fractured limestone coupled with a myriad of caves in the area might pose a problem in the form of landslides, while an 18-month meteorological study showed that the winds being funneled through the gorge could gust up to 130 kilometers an hour. Hurricane. Okay, so 81 miles per hour for my fellow Americans out there forces. Wind tunnels led to alterations in the shape of the road deck and some detailed corrections being made to the shape of the pylons, but by late 1998 the final design was approved. Could you imagine going through there, 81 mile an hour winds, whatever the kilometer was that he said, right? That is insane. I mean, I know when we have some bad storms around here, you know, sometimes we'll have like 40, 50 mile an hour wind gusts and it's like, wow, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a lot of wind, right? 81. 
imagine driving a big box truck across that bridge. 81 mile an hour wind gust comes ripping through there. I'd be afraid it's going to toss me off the damn bridge. I don't know. <laughs> the project went out to tender in 1999 and was awarded to, and uh, my French pronunciation I know, Compagnie Effage du Viaduc de Milo. Now, all they had to do was build the tallest bridge piers in the world and put a 36,000 ton freeway on top of them. Yeah. No worries. Oh, and that was just for starters. Then they had to erect seven steel pylons, each weighing 700 tons, and secure the road deck with 5,000 tons of pre stressed steel cabling. And they had to do it in under four. Pre stressed. I like that. Yeah, so. So the cables only stretch so much, right? And then they kind of settle in. So you pre-stretch them. That is smart. Wow. That is very smart. With 5,000 tons of pre-stressed steel cabling. And they had to do it in under four years or face a fine of $30,000 a day for late delivery. Even some of the engineers Jeez. on the project had their doubts. Two weeks after the laying of the first stone on December the 14th, 2001, the workers started digging the shafts for the pilings, four to each pier, 15 meters deep and five meters in diameter. The footings on top of the concrete pilings took another 2,000 cubic meters of concrete, and now progress began to show above the ground. Now, back to our video in just a moment, but first, a word from today's video sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace, go check it out, guys. The peers start to grow. Every three days, each pier grew by four meters. Then, because of the tapering design Buffer. of the piers, the 15-ton mold had to be taken down and adjusted for the next pour. The concrete was being manufactured on site, so a new layer could be poured every 20 minutes, and the speed of construction increased rapidly. Being constructed on site. So what does that mean? Were they taking, like whatever like what so concrete anyways what is that just like sand and clay and water right mixed together i don't i don't understand how concrete doesn't just form naturally in nature really if it if it's just those simple ingredients but uh were they just taking that out of the the landscape and mixing it or are they just bringing in all the ingredient just mixing it on site i wonder if that's what he's saying i mean either way Either way, this is a massive undertaking. Now, it was during this phase that geologists' fears were realized. A violent storm caused a landslide, and 4,000 cubic meters of rock were dislodged near the first pier. Fortunately, the pier wasn't damaged, but manpower had to be diverted to stabilizing the grounds, and time was of the essence. Mm. Construction continued, with each team aiming its pier to an exact point in the sky. With no visual reference as to whether the piers were straight, the engineers relied on GPS, using multiple satellite feeds to pinpoint the destination of the build. What? So they're just just winging it, kind of. By November 2003, the piers had reached their full height a month ahead of schedule and accurate to within two centimeters. Meanwhile, wow. the steel company, Eiffel, founded by Gustave Eiffel of Eiffel Tower fame, was manufacturing the steel road deck. The 2,200 separate sections, each weighing up to 90 tons and some as long as 22 meters, then had to be transported hundreds of kilometers by road and welded together on site. The plan okay, was to yeah. slide the two colossal sections across the piers from either side of the valley so they would meet in the middle. Okay, so... So they just slide it out. I mean, this is all in, in French, too, but... Okay, we're just going to keep watching. Either side of the valley, so they would meet in the middle. Like, how do they do that? Pylons come into play. To stop the leading edge from dipping and knocking down the piers, one of the pylons was installed on each section to hold the cable stays supporting the front of the deck. Temporary steel support towers were then placed at each halfway point between the piers to make the distance between them more manageable. Even so, the road deck would still have to be launched over greater distances 
than had ever been done before. Also, simply launching the sections over the edge by pushing them with hydraulic jacks was not going to work in the case of such enormous sections. The jacks would need a considerable amount of help along the way. The engineers designed a novel system of pairs of hydraulically driven wedges, four sets of which were installed on top of each pier. The upper and lower wedge of each pair pointed in opposite directions. Controlled by a computer so that they acted in perfect unison, the lower wedges were to slide under the upper ones, forcing them high enough to lift the road deck off of its supports. Uh. Both wedges would then slide forward, moving the deck forward. The lower wedges would then return to their starting positions, followed by the upper wedges, leaving the deck 600 millimeters further along its journey. Then the four minute cycle would be repeated. Uh, okay. No launch had ever been done this way before, and there was no chance to test the system. It just had to work. <laughs> and it is. And everything went smoothly, until six months into the launch when one of the launch systems failed. Oh. To make matters worse, the meteorologists were predicting a storm, and the deck was in a vulnerable position with its leading edge hanging out into space. The engineers had underestimated the friction between the sliding surfaces of the wedges and the non-stick PTFE coating which had worn away. There were no spare parts for this impromptu design, but there were hmm. as yet unused pairs of wedges which were destined for the piers that had yet to be reached by the advancing deck. The team hastily stripped them of their coating and repaired the damaged units while the weathermen chewed their nails and monitored the impending storm. Disaster had just been averted. The deck reached its next support safely all right heading for the middle hit like and subscribe over the next months the two sections of the deck edged towards each other as each Why reached its next support the teams breathed a collective sigh of relief and checked the weather forecast before pushing on to the next stage things were going well but there was still no guarantee that the two sides would meet in the right place even the slightest inaccuracy could mean that they'd built the most expensive white elephant in europe the engine yeah because if they're going from each end and it's just off so really if, if you would have just went from one end all the way across right instead of trying to meet in the middle you'd have a better chance of success right but if you try to meet in the middle you know you might have just just that little offset where things don't connect oh man i bet they're nervous at this point i would be engineers installed a gps system on the leading edge of the section that was to make the final push so they could compare the actual position with their calculations they now approached the most difficult part of the launch bridging the river itself not only was this the longest span of the viaduct but it was also the one place where it had been impossible to erect any intermediate supports the leading edge of the longer section launched across 342 meters of open space okay. and the teams held their breath as the suspense mounted and the french prime minister was also due to drop by to see the event so they couldn't put a central support structure under it to help like because it, the middle was so deep wow so that just adds to everything like man what? i'm on the edge of my seat over here guys no pressure as the edges got closer together the tension eased it looked as if it would be a near perfect fit a magnum of champagne was positioned at the point of contact and as it exploded other corks were popped celebrations were in order because the discrepancy in the alignment was a matter of millimeters of course the project was nowhere near complete but the first two major challenges the piers and the road deck had been successfully navigated yeah and they were still on schedule and and that's of course it's not done at this point right but uh like you said that's that's a huge challenge and that's a major major uh milestone you know what i mean like if you're you know because because it's like easy after that right that that's the hard part you got the hard part out of the way that would bring you know lift your spirits right bring down any uh sorts of anxieties about the project yeah that's stupid i hate the lights on this there we go I'll turn it back off i don't know how it turned on because steel is flexible more so than some of them had realized the road deck had an undulating appearance at this stage there was a bit of a cause for worry would the cable stays pull it straight or had they run across another unexpected problem <laughs> i mean it could have just been the world's tallest wavy bridge if, if they didn't fix that right
using an ancient technique, okay, in a modern bridge. Before their question could be answered, the remaining five pylons had to be erected. These 700-ton steel monsters had to be raised through 90 degrees and accurately positioned on top of the piers. To achieve this, they borrowed a 2,000-year-old technique from the ancient Egyptians who really? had used it to erect obelisks and piers at Karnak. While the Egyptians would have used slaves as their motive power, the 21st We don't use slaves these days. <laughs> Century engineers had the advantage of hydraulics to lift this massive weight. The principle was straightforward, as Archimedes summed it up. Give me a lever long enough on a fulcrum, and I'll move the world. Very true. Very true. Yeah, it's the same thing as when you can't get something off, you're trying to pry off a stuck bolt. What you do is you grab a giant bar piece of pipe or something stick over your wrench so that you got like you know make it longer way more leverage and just pops right off it's an awesome awesome thing science i love it on top of the road deck the team put up two enormous towers secured by cables and equipped with a hydraulic system capable of raising a thousand tons as the hydraulics lifted each pylon it pivoted slowly until it was vertical and could be lowered safely onto its anchoring point with all seven pylons in place the team attached the cables which supported the deck as the tension on the cables increased so the kinks in the road deck smoothed out and another challenge had been met. There nice. just remained the finishing touches. The road surface added 10,000 tons to the weight of the deck, and just to be sure it was safe, they drove 36 monster trucks with a combined weight of over 900 tons onto the longest span. The distortion. <laughs> and what? And what if they messed up? Then you got 36 monster trucks going down in this giant valley. Uh, I wouldn't have wanted to be the one to test it. Mission was negligible. On December the 14th, 2004, President Jacques Chirac formally opens the viaduct and it opened to traffic two days later. This was almost a month ahead of schedule. Nice. The critics are proved wrong. Yeah, they are. The construction of the. Screw those haters. The Minor Viaduct broke several records. Two of the piers were the highest in the world. The pylon on top of the second pier was the highest bridge tower in the world. At 270 meters above the town, the road deck was almost twice the height of the previous European record holders. Critics of the project had said that the technical difficulties would be insurmountable and the whole scheme was doomed to fail. But they got it and they didn't fail, so huh. <laughs> And they were proved very wrong. Others yes, said that were. tourists would avoid the bridge rather than pay the toll fee. The project would never break even and toll income would never amortize the initial investment and the contractor would have to be supported by subsidies. They would be proved wrong the following summer. The Milo Viaduct was an instant success and at the height of the tourist season carried more than 60,000 vehicles per day. At €8.30 Euros and 30 cents per vehicle, the Viaduct... That's a lot. And also they're charging... So it's like a toll road, what we would, what would we call it, a toll road here. Um, so they're making money. I'm going to skip back just a second here and listen. Carried more than 60,000 vehicles per day. At eight euros and 30 cents per vehicle, the viaduct would pay for itself in less than three years. Nice. And now they're just like banking, just making a ton of money. Do they still charge for this? Are you French? Have you drove across this thing? Let me know. And also, subscribe to the channel. What are you doing? Hit subscribe. Thank you. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you <laughs> it even pops up on the screen right after I said that. Yeah. Go check out his channel. Uh, he's got a ton of channels. He's got this one's called Mega Projects. He's got one called Side Projects. He's got one called Brain Blaze, which is great. That one's perfect because he reacts to a script that he's never read before. So he's got a writer, a few writers, writes the script, and then he reads it and reacts to it in real time it's 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 fantastic but anyways you guys have a super fun awesome day and i'll catch you in the next one take care bye